welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who is delighted to hear that some people are willing to pay him to come out early, if you take my meaning, Mr. Lauren Bobgarden! Lauren! What's up, Brent Adams? How's it going, buddy? <laughs> uh, and I'm not. I'm not pleased to find out about what you said in the opening. Uh, I, I beg to disagree, sir. You've often told me, man, if only coming out early was a virtue. And I said, listen, that's between you and your wife. If, you know, if she likes the way that you roll, you know, you guys finish up in time to watch the Big Bang Theory or whatever it is you do. I don't care. What you're alluding to, well, what you said was that I, I was happy to find out that someone was willing to pay me. Yes. And uh, I'm not happy to find it out, and we're going to see why in just a minute. But how was your week, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. I've been I've been out of town actually, uh, as as I guess many people are for uh, for Labor Day weekend, people being yep. off work and whatnot. But my wife and I have been visiting her family, and so I've been I've been gone, and as a result of that, have not played a lot of the games that I wish I was playing. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I won't be making up for lost time this week. Well, that's good. That's that's. I, I will balance you out this week, Brent, because I think it has been probably the most gaming heavy week I have had in a year. I realized after looking at my oh, yeah. timers on Steam and uh, PlayStation that I have played over twenty five hours this week, which is a that's victory right there. Tremendous amount Every, of gaming. Everybody, I'm, I'm just healthy. join me. Everybody, just join me. <laughs> Deep breath in. That's what victory smells like. Ooh, victory sm- kind of smells like socks, doesn't it? Ew. That is a part-time job. <laughs> yes, and it is. frightening, and frightening actually. But uh, no, it's glorious. It's glorious. It is, and I can't wait to talk about. it. I'm very excited. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna uh, we're gonna go into the garage. Yeah, we to... got a lot in the garage this week. It, it started out as as sort of I thought it was gonna be Slim Pickens because Wrong. there's been just a lot of Metal Gear and Mad Max talk, honestly, but we have a lot in the garage this week. We really do. Starting with Star Wars Battlefront beta. Uh we Woo-hoo! have we have discovered I've said we've discovered. EA EA told us. I mean it's not like we, <laughs> we, we discovered because they told us. It's not as though we were investigating or like picking <laughs> locks or anything like that to get this information. EA basically ran us down, kicked us in the balls. And told us that Star Wars Battlefront beta is coming in early October. They haven't said, uh, or they haven't set a more specific date than that right now. The beta is going to include the Walker Assault on Hoth, which we've seen some gameplay of, a 40 player multiplayer battle that's going to allow you to also play as Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, as you see at the end of that little gameplay video from Battlefront. Spoiler warning. Um,. In addition to that, they're also going to have the uh, the survival mission on Tatooine, which I I thought we'd seen that, but I thought that they said that wasn't Tatooine. I thought it was supposed to be Jakku, so maybe it's a different survival mission. But I thought that the the one Jakku mission we saw was on, or it was a survival mission. Pardon me, but anyway, the point is, you get a fucking survival mission on Tatooine or Jakku, assuming that they're not the same fucking place uh they're also going to uh include the the drop zone uh some sort of gameplay mode called drop zone which they're going to have more details on in the coming weeks they haven't really told us what that is i guess that the the big question here is what are we going to have to do to get into this beta lorne are we going to have to uh we're going to have to pre-order this son of a bitch no it's an open public beta hey that's great news thanks ea Yes, I'm, I'm, and I'm excited about it, Brent, because this is a game that I'm kind of on the fence about, yeah. and the best way to find out if you want to get something is actually play it yourself. Yeah, I agree. Uh, or, or you uh, could watch somebody else play it, except Jimmy Kimmel won't like you then. So, the, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about there, that, that, too. But that. Uh, that is, uh, um, uh, yeah, th- yeah, I mean, the best way is to get your hands on it, and there's a, a, a decent amount of content they're putting out here. It's not like... You know, I, I would have been understanding if they had put out one map and one mode. I, that would have I would have understood that. And so, yeah, I'm very excited. Getting your hands on the game is the best way to do it. Uh, my the the conundrum I have is is, and I'm curious about you, Brent. Mm. PC or PlayStation? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I really it's going to come down to the. I guess it's just going to come down to the minimum regs because I uh, or the Rex because Q does not sound like a G. 
But the point is that I am just going to have to wait and see what the requirements are for the PC because I would plan to get fucking Phantom Pain on PC, and you saw how that worked out for me. But I don't know, given that the online portion of Battlefront is going to be so popular and so much of the forefront of that game, no single-player mission and so forth, then perhaps they're going to be aiming for a little bit broader audience, and I'll be able to run it pretty decently on my PC. But if I can run it on the PC, I think I'd rather do it there. Otherwise, I'll default to PlayStation 4 as my backup choice. I think I'm probably going to go the same way. I think the decision for me is going to be, you know, I, I don't know if the people that I regularly play with are going to play it on the P- are going to play it, and that sort of would drive me to the PC. Yeah, uh, I, I always want to do first person shooters on the PC yeah. uh, versus the console if I can. They they tend to work um, pretty well there. So actually, you can consider this a call to arms for all the OGers out there. Please let us know if you're playing it on the PC or the PS4 yep. to help Brent and I make a decision. I wonder if that's something that we could do. Like, as a service to the community, I mean, not just for our own selfish reasons, but I wonder if it would benefit people if we were to do some sort of, like, poll or survey on the website when a big multiplayer game like this comes out, where we just ask people, what platform are you planning to get this on? And, you know, just just so people can kind of say, well, hey, it looks like everybody's going to get it on PlayStation 4, maybe I'll get it there too. Maybe that's something we could do for Battlefront, just you know, just to see if I don't know if, if anybody yeah, gets any an use out of it. We should we should talk we should talk it through and see what kind of uh, what we have what we have on the website itself to do that. And people sound off in the comments and let us know if you think that would be of value to you. All right, so uh, let's move on. Machinima has just settled with the Federal Trade Commission here in the U.S. The FTC over charges that they took money from Microsoft to create deceptive videos endorsing the Xbox One console, but not revealing that they were, in fact, a paid endorsement video. They were presented as though it was an opinion piece. It was just somebody saying, oh, I love the Xbox One for whatever reason. But uh, they did not reveal that uh, Microsoft had, in fact, paid for that content. And, uh, And so Machinima has now had to uh, settle with the FTC, who was, uh, who was charging them with uh, customer deception or consumer deception, which uh, is not really much of a distinction, seeing as how customer and consumer means basically the same thing. And I now <laughs> question why I corrected myself. Lauren, save me. Yes, uh, I think this is a fantastic thing, Brent. They, of course, in the article, do not disclose any of the details of how much money was exchanged, yeah. but just the fact that they were put in this position, charges were brought, and that they were forced to settle, I think, is a positive thing for consumers. And hopefully, moving forward, we will not see behavior like this, where people are taking money and doing uh, things on social media, and in this case, YouTube, uh, where they're representing uh, themselves as giving opinions, when in fact, they are paid endorsements. And we did see um, some backlash to this in the time, and some of the videos were uh, labeled that they had received money for this. Um, but I think it's a fantastic thing, and we just wanted to call it out for people, and hopefully we will continue uh, to see uh, companies behaving more on the up and up in the future. The thing that I'm kind of curious about in, in regards to this story is Microsoft's role in all this. Uh, the FTC, in the IGN video that we linked to, they state that the FTC did not go after Microsoft because Microsoft moved so swiftly in the aftermath to ensure that all future videos that they were paying for were advertised as such. They said this is a paid video that you know Microsoft has bought in order to in order to talk about the Xbox One. And I'm just I'm just wondering, like, did Microsoft specifically ask Machinima to make videos that did not appear to be advertisements? And if so, uh, it, you know, wouldn't that make them culpable? And I, I don't. You know, maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's why they're not involved. But I just found it a little bit interesting that. That you know they they threw the book at Machinima, but Microsoft skirted uh, completely free of this. And I, I don't know. Perhaps that means that all the wrongdoing was Machinima. But I was just wondering: it, Do you think that Microsoft has any? Do they have any responsibility in in you know in doing this kind of thing? Certainly they do. I think if they you know if they solicited this just uh, discreetly, and of course we don't have any of the details uh, necessarily uh, from inside the case. But absolutely, if they discreetly said, please make a video that doesn't look like it's an advertisement, I think they they should have culpability regardless of what they did in the aftermath. But, I I mean, I guess we're going to have to assume that um, the FTC felt satisfied that they had been 
justly punished or or didn't require punishment. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I guess my I guess my my skeptic meter is kind of going off because I'm just like. I noticed that the company that's got a lot of fucking money got off scot free here, and uh, the uh, but the, U- the the YouTube network they're they're the ones who ultimately ended up uh, ponying up. I hope I hope it was worth it to them. Uh, I mean, not that Machina but needs a fucking help. They're they're doing just fine, I imagine. Yeah, that's a true story. Moving on. Um, yes. Next story, we got uh, we got a peek at what's coming in PlayStation Four System Software three and it's actually quite a bit. I guess I guess the headlines are the the YouTube Live feature. You're not going to be able to stream games to yep. YouTube Live and, and the whole YouTube gaming app and portal. You've got uh, you've got some interesting social features like events. Like if there's going to be like a double XP weekend, or if you're playing a game where there's a limited time frame, you're going to be able to get a boss or something like that. There's now a new hub for looking at those kinds of events with your games. Uh, you're going to be able to create communities uh, with your user, w- w- with your fellow users around things like games, genres. There's going to be message message boards, discussions. You'll be able to share screenshots. Uh, that's something that's really interesting because I remember Daniel and I having a discussion about this years ago and about why Xbox hadn't done this with Live uh, at that time. And yeah, essentially, um, clan support. Yeah, yeah, basically, and it's, it's a great idea. Uh, if you've got a PS Plus account, your cloud storage has been increased from one gigabyte to ten gigabytes. You're also going to be able to share video clips to Twitter, maximum of ten seconds. Uh, and there's also going to be some interesting, uh, some interesting stuff with your with your friends list specifically. You're not going to be able to have favorite groups that you'll be able to use to find friends quickly uh, for whatever purposes you might deem worthy. Uh, what anything else I missed here that you thought uh, bared mentioning, Lauren? Stickers. They got stickers too. Stickers, yeah, that's important to know. Oh, no, I think the big though? ones. I think the big ones are going to be communities, uh, and certainly that you know that hopefully there, I'm sure there will be an Outlaw Gamers uh, community for real uh, on PS4, which is awesome. Because I'm very we excited are a community for that, and we have a name, which is the requirements for creating a community. <laughs> we fit those requirements. We do. We've got um, all the criteria. No, I think those things are fantastic, man. Online gaming, online storage capacity uh, being increased by tenfold is huge because I actually have run out of storage space yeah i'm, I'm um and close. uh you know youtube live I, I haven't played i think the events thing is very cool yeah. you know, letting you know when big events are going on in your game i haven't played uh and i think once i think once that events thing is live you might actually see gaming companies utilizing uh that feature because that events thing is live yeah um if that grabs people's attention i think that's, you might see companies true. design stuff around that no release date yet no but i don't think it's far off i, I don't know exactly when it no. is but i believe the article said coming soon well they they did start a beta for it uh that's not linked in this article but i think that was on the official playstation blog they started a beta for it about a week ago so presumably it uh it's going to be it's going to be pretty damn soon maybe i don't know maybe end of the month beginning of october something like that i don't know but right we'll find out soon enough let's see what's next (laughs) jim sterling big jim sterling sounding off on the article we or or the situation, the story we were talking about uh, was it last week? We were talking about the pre-orders for Deus Ex: Mankind Divided, and the augment this pre-order plans, where the more people you get pre-ordering the game, the more tiers of pre-order perks unlock. And uh, I'm going to choose to interpret that as T E A R S. The pre-order tiers that 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 uh, that might be an episode title. Anyway. Uh, Jim has, he did like just a really quick off the cuff video on YouTube, just talking about this. I think he's since done a full episode of the Jim Quisition. Yep. Laying out some of his thoughts and, and they're pretty much what you'd expect. This is a terrible idea. Now, one thing that, one thing that he points out that I thought was pretty, I'm going to say, I don't know if you can hear this. I'm going to set this down now. Cause I'm basically using a rattle shaped like a screwdriver, uh, as I sit here talking and it just occurred to me that might not be the most pleasant accompaniment to uh, to this podcast anyway back on subject uh jim made a really interesting connection which was the the union of pre-order content with crowdfunding yes and i, I had not put that together but that's a brilliant analysis of what's going on here and also the, the perfect way to demonstrate why this is uh, unholy and and basically 
uh, heresy against Odin and all that is good in the universe. <laughs> but uh, I haven't watched the 14-minute video yet. I haven't had time to check that out. I've watched the one that we're linking to here. And Jim makes some great points about why this is just such a fucking terrible idea. And it, like we were talking about last week, the entire point of this, the, the whole point of this is to encourage pre-ordering. And I, I think that gamers are, are getting savvy to the fact that the pre-order mechanic and culture and everything that kind of works around game pre-orders is the source of a lot of what is wrong with the game industry or at least the the sales side of the game industry well and this one is particularly egregious brent and you know it's just you know, the other thing that's interesting about this one is they don't talk about numbers either they don't say at fifty thousand pre-orders we're going to do this at 75 they just say percent yeah. at 25 percent global pre-orders yeah We'll be doing this at 50%. Like, what's the 50% of what? What's the number? Well, 100? It's, or? it's Square Enix. So basically, they're going to take the population of Earth and add another 25% to it and say, if we don't hit that target, we fail, the game sucks, and we hate you all. And then they go the route of Konami and just make fucking mobile games. So basically, we need, according to what you were saying, we need about, what, 9 billion pre orders? Correct. Or something along those lines. I mean, I'm just rounding here. That's, that's right. And, uh, and, and basically, there's not enough people on Earth to do that. So, yeah. Square Enix, so, Square Enix wins again, I guess. Yeah, this, this, this is just so bad, Brent, that we decided to talk about it two weeks in a row on the show. I, I think it's, it is an interesting uh, analysis yeah. that, that understand that it's basically sort of the, the, the format of a crowdfunded campaign yep. married into a, a, a pre-order nonsense to try it's just it's it's laughable and ludicrous all the way around and i encourage everybody just simply never to buy this game <laughs> i hate to do that too because i fucking love deus ex and i'm really excited for this game but uh it it, it does i tell you it, it really does make me reconsider how bad i want to play it it really does because i just it's one thing to not pre-order the game which i'm not doing under any circumstance but I am so I'm I'm so offended by what they've done here that I am beginning to I'm beginning to really question how much I want to play this. Yeah, uh, it's it's and I'm I'm kidding, but it is. I mean, it is that just it, it's so ah, it's, it's so I feel so dirty just talking about it. Well, let's move on and talk about something that is also is going to make me feel dirty. Well, you know, possibly so. Uh, Batman Arkham Knight on PC, as we all know, was the laughing stock. Of, uh, of, of the playgrounds that video gamers of the world attend, even though most of them are out of college now. But we all, we all go to that playground to relive the glory days and, uh, and, and pick on each other. And normally the PC uh, kids, you know, the ones hanging out on the cool set of monkey bars, throwing things at the console kids underneath with, you know, their, their lower VRAM and, and memory stats. But uh, the console kids claimed the monkey bars for their own when Batman Arkham Knight came in on PC and failed hard. And we just thought we would update you guys and let you know that the patch, the long-awaited PC patch, is out for Arkham Knight. I've got it installed. I haven't really got a chance to play the game yet. I was, I was doing this literally in the moments before we started recording today. All I've had the ability to do is uh, to get the update done, to go in and switch on everything up to maximum and run the, uh, the PC performance test. And I was getting, eh, I was, you know, it was, it was stuttering just a little bit. So I turned off, I think one of the NVIDIA interactive features, like the interactive smoke and fog, uh, feature, yep. I turned that off and now I've got 59 frame average, uh, out of the game. 59 Brent, that's not 60. You're going to have to turn something else <laughs> off. <laughs> that's a good point. But anyway, uh, it's re it, the, the, the performance test is running really, really good for me. Hopefully, that's indicative of where the game is. But, I mean, I literally started the game. You do that first little scene, and then it goes to the gameplay where you see... We saw that we, this is gameplay that we've seen. We see the cop coming down the sidewalk about to go into the diner, and then you beeped me that you were ready to go, and so I stopped there. But I'm really, really hoping that the game runs as smooth as a performance test because it, it looked fine. And uh, and ran silky smooth. So hopefully this is going to be the Batman Arkham Knight experience that you didn't get. Yeah. But I will be rewarded for my patience by having. 
Um, yeah, we'll see how rewarded you are. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, I'm glad they finally came out with a patch. It's too little too late for me. I, I've already played the game through. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I didn't have as many problems as others, or I would not have played the game through. Right. Um, at some point, I might go back. I, I don't know, honestly, if I'll go back and play the game or not. Um, I got so much gaming going on right now, but uh, glad to hear there's a patch out finally. Yeah. Way to go. Yeah, it's not, like, uh, it's not like you're suffering from lack of quality titles. That's a true story. All right. Last up in the garage, uh, we have the Halo 5 opening cinematic. Lauren, why? <laughs> uh, I kind of knew you were going to ask me that, Brent, but, but, yeah. I, and I know haters got to hate. However, I'm not hating. I'm, kidding. I'm just, I'm, kidding. I'm just asking. I joke. I'm I as, joke because I'm I as care. Predictable as the sun in this regard. Uh, there's three reasons, pretty much, Brent. The first okay. one is that our, our, our pure Xboxers don't get a ton of love on the show because we don't have the <laughs> Xbox One. So I thought we'd th- give them a little bit of love. Uh, number two, because the, it was, I thought it was a cool opening and made me want to play Halo, so that was a reason to put it in here. Okay, I don't disagree. Uh, number three, and most importantly, however, really, honestly, is because Nathan Fillion's in it, and that just because Nathan Fillion's in it. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with your analysis right now, Lauren, uh, and the problem is that Nathan Fillion wasn't reasons one and two in your list. <laughs> I know, right? That's, uh, I, I, wish, I wish he would do more video games. I, I oh I agree. I wish he'd do, I, I honestly I don't care if he does more video games. I just wish he'd do more video game cinematics because then we could put him in the show. That's a true story. Yeah, no, I just I, I actually you know Halo games are are I, I loved ODST. I played the last couple and I played them all the way through. Yeah. Uh, if this was out on PC, I would definitely play it. They're interesting worlds, and this one has a bit more of an ODST feeling to it, if I recall. But uh, right. I, you know. I I, I thought it was a great trailer. I would love, I, I would love to again to play to play more Nathan Fillion, and so uh, I, I just thought it was cool, man. So I put it here. That's all. All right, we are in the clubhouse, and before we get into our topic this week, Brent, I believe it's your turn to tell us about the poll. Yes, indeed, sir. And uh, the question that we asked was, "How do you feel?" How do you feel about Konami's approach to reviews with the Phantom Pain? I'm not going to lie to you. I've been awake for a very long time, and I've recently had red Kool-Aid. So this week's show is brought to you by my impending psychotic break. (laughs) Um, Back to the poll. In answer to the question, how do you feel about Konami's approach to reviews with the Phantom Pain? The fourth place answer with 5% was, I think it might be a good reproach with some refinement. Uh, not a that lot was of one person accidentally clicking the wrong choice. That, that did not get a lot of traction, uh, as it turned out. Third place with 15% of the vote was, I don't think it's a good approach, but I don't think it harms the reviews. Second place with 24% of the vote went to the answer, it is the reviewer's job to not be affected by anything but their play experience. And the number one answer with 56% of the vote, the Outlaw Gamer audience chose they're clearly trying to manipulate the reviews with this process. Thank you very much for voting. <laughs> yes. Um, I was told on Twitter by Which some... Which makes it true, by the way. Some dude, some mysterious dude, says on Twitter, this is sorry to say, but the reviewers got the game with them to finish at home after the boot camp. Uh, I asked for a link to look into that myself. I've gone and Googled it a little bit and haven't been able to find confirmation. But anyway, just uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, there, there may be some, uh, there, you know, there may, there may be some other facts out there that, uh, that we are unaware of that we might need to take into consideration at some point. Yeah. I think overwhelmingly, obviously as this poll shows Brent, but also in the comments of last week's show, you know, people, didn't like this idea and um you know i i uh there's you know some people asked uh uh you know burko suggested that uh, how could we say that this doesn't um alter the reviews and i I, you know i I haven't gone back and listened to the show again but i I think you know i think my take anyway was not that it it didn't alter the review but i can't see how it would make the reviews more positive uh than they would have otherwise been i'm just not sure but um, certainly I think the overwhelming feeling is, is whether or not this affected the review, whether or not these are trained professionals, whether or not reviewers are finishing the games they review, which is another discussion, yeah. uh, entirely. So there's something about this feels a bit hinky and it doesn't feel like it, uh, it's at least reported purpose, which was to keep, uh, secrets about the story. It, it feels unnecessary. These are people 
who professionally review things like this all the time, who are under non-disclosure agreements, and uh, it doesn't seem like it would serve his purpose. But interesting discussion on the comments, and thank you all again for participating. So what are we going to talk about this week? This week, Brett, there was an interesting story that came out uh, talking about Steam's biggest selling tw- games in 2015, uh, and particularly that half of them, no less than half of them, Brent, are games that are in early access. So you're telling me that six games so far in 2015, six games on Steam, have sold more than a million copies, and three of those games are Steam early access games. I um, was not telling you that, but you must have read the article, because that is exactly what the article says. That's, that's how, but that's how like, the professional news crews do it, like, like on those news magazine shows. Like they always sort of like go to the other anchor with just like a little bit of information, and then the other anchor like magically has all of all the facts, this mess. <laughs> you know, that's exactly right. That's- Which is why you and I are not currently hosting a news magazine <laughs> show. Although, although I don't understand why, for the life of me, I can't figure out how we haven't scored that gig yet. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, um, so anyway, the six games are Grand Theft Auto Five, yes. City Skyline, Rocket League. <laughs> Lauren will be yes. very happy to discover. Very happy. And they've sold over a, m- a million copies. And then Ark Survival Evolved, H1Z1, and Besiege. And those last three are the titles that have yet to leave early access. And this is a really interesting trend, given the fact that there was a there was a, a research for uh, there was a research firm that revealed that only twenty five percent of early access games have released a full final version since the program started in 2013. So it seems as though you're, you're not paying for the full game, which works out. Okay. Cause you're never getting the full game either. Right. Uh, at, at least if you're, uh, <laughs> at least if you're 75% of these steam early access titles, um, Lauren, Early access is is an interesting and I guess somewhat controversial thing. I can remember years ago on Epic Battle Cry, Daniel Kaiser saying sarcastically. I feel like when we say his name, there should be some sort of ethereal music. Dun, dun, dun. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> ethereal music, ethereal music. Right, right. Gotcha. I think you missed my intention. <laughs> anyway, um, Daniel said. We were talking, I I can't remember what the specific topic we were discussing was, but Daniel made some off the cuff comment about what's next. Before you know it, they're going to be charging you for beta access. And here we are, and it's (laughs) happened. But the thing is, people seem happy enough to do it, given, given the stat we just mentioned that three of the, of the most popular titles on Steam are, are games in early access. So it seems to me that, that people have, uh, People have, I guess, found their comfort zone with it, and yet there's certainly been controversy and certainly a lot of accusations hurled about incomplete games and, you know, charging for for broken experiences and all that. And I don't know. I mean, people seem to be going into it eyes wide open. Certainly they understand what the early access program is because Steam goes out of their way to explain it to you when you try to buy one of those fucking games. But... um, I don't know, Lauren. What, what do you think? I mean, for, for like just a second, what do you think about early access in general? Well, I think this is one, you know, this is what's interesting about, and I know you're asking me my personal opinion, but I think it's interesting about the story is that clearly overall, the community supports the concept of early access, obviously. Yes. I mean, obviously. And, and, and my experiences with early access have been, um, I, I, I like it. I like early access. I don't, you know, so I, I have a couple different perspectives on this, Brent, because I have the perspective of being a player and I have the perspective of being a developer. So when I worked in the golf club, uh, we released the game to early access and it was certainly an interesting uh, animal for sure. Right. Um, we had a lot of players that didn't understand the concept and, and were uh, very harsh on us. But by and large, I have to say that during the early, a- and the golf club is one of the games that left its early access period. We did early access for a few months and, uh, and then moved into a full retail version. And the community was um, essential in helping shape the, the nature of the game. And, and, and honestly, Brent, from a d- developer standpoint, um, so they, they were essential in shaping the game. But what I feel like it did, and, and I don't know if, this, if choosing to do the early access process helped create this culture or if the nature of HP Studios, the company I worked for, uh, was just that uh, they were already like this. But 
that idea of early access and the community being involved in the in the creation of the game carried through past the early access period. And to this day, HP Studios has a just a tremendous, tremendous amount of community involvement and feedback that goes directly into the design of the game. Right. Um, so I do think it's, a, it's I think it's a good thing for the industry uh, in the context of it, it gets developers uh, um, interacting with the community to develop their games, and I think that carries beyond into other games and beyond the early access period. Well, I, I go ahead. I, I think that's a conditional statement, though. What, what what you just said. I think early access is a good thing if it gets the inv- the developers involved in the community and and you know, utilizing their feedback and everything to, to make games better. And, but and I don't think there's, I, 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 and I totally get what you're saying there. I a hundred percent get it. I don't, I almost think it's not possible for it to be conditional uh, in the context of it is a fundamental sort of premise of early access. And so at least during the early access period, I would assume game developers are taking that feedback and utilizing it because otherwise, why would they even be in an early access period? But I guess I can sort of hear the cynical response to that already, which is they need the money. Yeah, well, and that's the, that's the thing. It's like, and and this this is just me asking questions as opposed to sort of expressing my, my viewpoint on it because my viewpoint sure. on it is just, you know, it, it's it's a it's the business of the person paying the company and the company offering the game. If if the two of them want to, you know, create this contract to exchange money for early, right, that's absolutely early access right to, to the so. game. It's it's totally up to them. I got no problem with it. Um, but th- the question that I have is. Could you do all this without money trading hands? Could you grant early access to the game to whoever wants it, incorporate their feedback to make the game better, be involved in the community? What does the financial transaction with an early access title, what does that buy you exactly? What, well, is, is it just sort of a gatekeeper that, that, that guarantees that you're only getting people who are really, really passionate about the game involved in the process because they're the only ones presumably who are willing to pay even a little bit of money to to get access to a game that is going to be incomplete and broken and so forth well i certainly do think uh, my first reaction re- reaction to that my my initial sort of gut response to that brent is that without the money i would be concerned that people would would uh just you know they would download the game and if it wasn't in the state that they wanted they didn't like it or whatever they would just walk away from it and so now you would have yeah. And and then how would you, I guess, technologically, I was just thinking you'd have to revoke their ability to play it at some point, because the idea isn't just giving away the game for free. Right. Right. So uh, it is an interesting point, Brent. I, you know, it does, I, I don't know, would it make any sense to do a smaller amount of money, $10, for example, on a $20, $30 game and let them uh, have early access to the game? And then if they choose to upgrade, you know, they want to continue to play the game after release. You know, I wonder how many of these games people play through early release and you know now they've put 40 hours into them by the time the game actually finishes it's not that like they're just not interested in playing it anymore and just not because it's a bad game or whatever but because because they played you know, it right i mean the games have a shelf life or whatever and so yeah. i've um, been through that exact experience with 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 beta test so uncharted 2 multiplayer when uncharted 2 because i famously on epic battle cry I talked about you know why the fuck would uncharted need multiplayer this yep. is bullshit you know it's a single player game and then uncharted 2 multiplayer beta came out i started playing it and could not stop i mean i was putting like five six hours a day into that fucking game i loved it and then the full version of the multiplayer released when the game dropped and i never touched it again yeah right i had a very similar experience yes yeah uh i'm not i mean i did play it for a little while but yes so um yeah i don't know but it's that's an interesting proposition brent i have to muse on that a little bit the idea of could it be done for free or could it be done or would it make sense to do it a lesser cost yeah um yeah, it is interesting for sure. I will tell you personally from my experiences, um, and I want to know, obviously we want to know other people's experiences, and I want to know, um, well, let me just back up here. So for my personal experiences, I have got, gotten in on early access on a few games, and and uh, so they've all been positive. Uh, Divinity Original Sin, um, uh, the, the um, I think it's now called, I think it's called Wreckfest, but it was the next car game from uh, the team that did Flat Out. Um, and that one I didn't play very much at all. You know, Divinity, and they've all been in different stages of of completion. Divinity Original Sin was nearly a complete game uh, when I joined. Uh, Wreckfest was is like was super bare bones when I first got it, but I actually got in on that game because I liked their product so much, and I wanted to support the development of their game, not by giving them feedback, but just financially, I wanted to support them. 
Um, and I knew that eventually I would want to buy the game. And I haven't played it very much at all, honestly. Um, obviously, the golf club uh, I bought in on as early access, but uh, several games I've gotten in early access. And I don't recall off the top of my head, Brent, ever feeling um, like I made a mistake in early access, actually. Right. Um, so I personally feel pretty positively about the, the process. I feel like, you know, I look at the games, I vet the games that I want to play. Um, Daisy obviously is, yeah. uh, still in early access. Uh, I think, I think, I, I think it is. Yeah. I, I haven't, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't checked on the, uh, after several years and I, I, you know, I don't totally understand that, but I also don't totally care. I don't get caught up in what they, you know, I mean, I, I played a hundred hours of Daisy in its earliest form of early access. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, couldn't care less whether they call themselves an early access or not. I, I don't quite get the idea. I mean, to me, sort of philosophically being in early access for three years feels just weird and sort of disingenuous. I mean, if they're just saying they're not done with the game, then I would sort of release the game and say, we're going to continue to support it. Right. Um, but, well, and uh, I, I think I think that's that's an interesting path to kind of go down. Be, I mean, given that statistic we were talking about, that uh, only twenty five percent of early access games have actually released a full final version. It seems Daisy is one of the ones that hasn't. For it, example, it seems that there is kind of a danger of games coming out on early access and sort of getting caught in some kind of limbo. You know, and I don't know if it's I don't know if it's down to these people were never going to be able to finish this game because the vision was too grand or, you know, they didn't really have the wherewithal to do what they were trying to do. Or if, if it's almost sort of an overload of what you were talking about earlier with your experience at HP studios, where they got really involved in implementing community feedback and all this stuff. And, you know, at some point in in the, in the development of a game, you have to, you have to draw a line and say, Here's the things that are actually going to go into the game and everything else we're just going to have to leave on the side for now. We're not going to be able to implement all these features. We're not going to be able to do all of these levels. We have a finite amount of resources to do this and we got to make a decision and just stick with it. And early access opens up this kind of interesting this interesting opportunity but that I think it could be maybe a double-edged sword where you find yourself gaining revenue from the game while it's still in this pre-release period. And it gives you the opportunity to just continually iterate on the game, to continually just improve and implement changes and, and suggestions and all that. And, and I wonder if there's not a temptation to kind of fall into where you just end up perfecting the game so much that you never really finish it. Uh, which I th- I think could be kind of an easy trap to fall into, you know, where you just want to continually tweak and improve and tweak and improve and and, and all that. So anyway, yeah, Daisy. Uh, um, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, I th- I think on some level that is exactly what's happened with Daisy. That's my that that's my guess. But uh, yeah, my my experience with it has, has been wholly positive, and I, I, I pretty too. much I, I look at my choices, I make my choices. I, I have been I have had more sort of disappointments or things not follow through on Kickstarter. Uh, than I have on uh, early oh, access. Now that that's an inter- that's an interesting comparison. Yeah, because uh, I, I hadn't really thought about those two being being similar, but they Related, certainly yeah. they certainly share some some DNA. I've had good good success. I say good success. I've had good experience with with early access. The only games I've got were Daisy and then that uh, that Clay Entertainment Stealth game. What was it called? Invisible Ink. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. Got, those are the only two things that I've got on on early access, or at least th- that I can remember. Maybe I've gotten something else that I just never played. But um, I, I had you know great experience with both of those, and it was really interesting. Although I didn't participate in terms of going and giving feedback on the game, but it was really interesting to see Invisible Ink, especially like in a very early form, and then you know how it turned out once uh, once the the final version of the game released, which was actually just. That was just this year. That that was just a few months ago that that happened. But um, anyway, I don't know. I I guess that I guess as as far as co- consumer advice goes, you know, the the trick here is to just keep both eyes open and to just you know to just make sure that you're comfortable going into it. And I I don't, I don't know. If there's really anything else to to do to do for it. I mean, certainly your exp- your excitement can spend your money. And I mean that was kind of me with Daisy. No, like Daisy standalone. Of course I'm gonna 
I'll drop whatever they want so I can play it early. And then I played it and I was like, oh, wow, this is really, like, this is really, really rough around the edges. I think I played it twice way back when it first came out on early access and I haven't, I haven't updated it or, or played it since. Yeah, it actually, it was the case with me too, Brent. I played, you know, I played the, the pre early access version of Daisy, you know, yeah, before yeah, the standalone. Obviously, obviously I did and, too. And uh, I, pl- I mean, I played the, the mod, shit out of that. Daisy and so, the mod. Yeah, exactly. And and so when the game came out as a standalone, I bought it immediately, and I've essentially not played it. Yeah, which is ironic. Which is fine with me. I'm happy to. I honestly, I'm happy to give them my money based on the amount of ludicrous hours of enjoyment I got uh, yeah. out of ver- versus what I paid for that initially. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not upset about it, but but it's true. I also have not played that much. What does it mean to be a success in early acts? I mean, because. I mean, think about what that means. And at, th- at this point, DayZ could come out, and I wouldn't really care. Because I've played, like you said, I've played hundreds and hundreds of hours of DayZ the mod. Well, to be fair, and, though, t- so hold on. To be fair, I-, I think, and tell me if you disagree with this, Brent, that right. DayZ is, is a truly in a category of its own. There is no okay, for- other game that I could think of that, that lives in that world of years of early access and had so much, has such a big audience from their... From the very, fr- you know what I mean, like okay, okay yes, I'll, I'll I'll grant you that, but just consider for a second what we were talking about with the Uncharted Two multiplayer beta and and, and how we have that kind of similar yeah. behavior. Yep. What does it mean to be a success in early access and failure on release? Well, so so let me give you another uh, example of, of this a little bit because Brent, you're not going to make as much money off early access sales as you will off a full retail release. Well, so Divinity Original Sin. Uh, which is a fantastic game and is very highly rated. Yeah. Uh, and there's now, I believe, a Kickstarter for Original Sin 2. Um, I, so I got into that game on early access, and the game was nearly finished. But they were very clear, and it was, I think I probably got it maybe a t- couple months before it released. But even, even then, it was, you know, and I would say it was nearly finished in terms of how well it played and how well everything worked and all the systems were in place and blah, blah, blah. Right. That game, uh, it was so good, as a matter of fact, that I played a couple hours of it, and I said, you know what? I'm going to stop playing this because they, they were very clear about, and thankfully so, that they were going to wipe your saves yeah. when they released the uh, finished product. And so they're totally reasonable. I'm not like upset that they chose to do that or whatever. But after a couple hours, I said, I don't want to play this anymore because I'll get sucked into this for 40 hours, and I will be pissed when, they, when my save gets wiped. Right. So I stopped playing it. And by the, when it did come out, I never went back and played it again. Hmm. And so I still have it sitting in my, my, and I still, I talk about it lovingly. I mean, it's a great game, but I've never gone back to play that game because other things distracted me and, you know, light, whatever happened, yeah. and I haven't gone back to play it. it. It is interesting, and this is something that we've touched on in the past, but it is, in, it is interesting how you have, there, there's sort of like your time with a game, and if you don't kind of jump on it, then you don't always get a second chance. Like, Batman Arkham City is a good example of that. You and I both played that early on. And walked away from it early on, and didn't come back to it again until years later, where we ultimately had a fantastic experience with it. Yep. But there, there's other games that I've not gone back to, and who knows? Did I miss out on another fantastic experience there? I don't know. It's a good question. I'm curious. So, uh, you know, I'm curious to hear what the listeners think, Brent. I do think that this article shows that, regardless of whether you know, however many people end up coming out of early access. I think that's very a very different thing from whether or not the community, the gamers at large, thinks it's a good thing. Because, again, you could play a game that technically doesn't come out of early access for months and hours and hours and be completely satisfied with the money that you spent on it. So just coming out of early access is not, I think, a, as meaningful a statistic as the statistic we have in this article. And so I'm very curious to hear what listeners think. I'm very curious to hear... Uh, Brent, if anybody out there is playing Ark Survival Evolved, because I had not heard of this game until this article, and I went and watched a few videos on it, and it looks actually really interesting. Yeah, I don't I, know if you have you seen it. Yeah, I have. Like I've I've heard quite a bit about Ark uh, lately, just within the last month or so, and I, I've seen that it's it's getting pretty popular with uh, with Steam. Steam yeah. players. Yeah, I'm curious if our listeners are playing it. I, w- I would like a report if I should consider getting this game, but. Uh, um, yeah, Brent, I'd like to hear what the listeners have to say, what their thoughts are. Do you guys think that uh, that early access is a good thing, or do you think, again, it's a it's a money-grubbing tactic to get you to pay and beta test, which is not, I, I do not believe that, but, um, but I'm curious to hear what the listeners think. All right, guys, we are going to hit the road and talk about some of the games we've been playing this week. 
And I go first to Lauren Baumgarten to talk about his brief experience with Metal Gear Solid Five. Well, no, actually, not that brief, Brent. I, pl- I played seven and a half hours of the game. Okay, well, I, I, I got the, the impression I got from your text message is that it was a little bit less than that. No, no, no. I mean, relatively speaking, certainly relative to the size of the game. It's, yes, it's brief. Yes, but it, I played true. seven and a half hours of this game, and I'm really looking forward to talking about it. We're going to talk about Mad Max as well. I'm looking forward to talking about that. Um, I think I, I put quite a few posts on the activity feed this weekend, so I think some people might be. Uh, interested to hear uh, what I have to say, uh, hopefully, but um, I'm eager to talk about it. There will be some minor, minor spoilers, uh, particularly just about uh, roughly the first hour of the game or so. The rest of it, I, I'm not really going to be talking story. I'm not even really going to be talking story about that first part, but for people that are very sensitive to it, just know um, that there's some minor, minor spoilers, and I'll, and I'll start at the beginning talking about the opening of the game, and then after that, there shouldn't be anything that's spoiler. It's all mechanic stuff and that sort of thing. So, uh, my experience, Brent, has been very interesting, and, and, and I will try not to um, pontificate for too long, uh, but it's been very interesting. I'm really starting struggling. The, starting the clock now. St- <laughs> uh, l- l- let's put it this way. My conversation may be in line with the Hideo Kojima game. So, <laughs> um, so I, I really kind of struggled whether or not to get this, whether or not to get Mad Max. Um, I chose to get Metal Gear Solid, 60 bucks. Um, uh, bought it, downloaded it, uh, was excited to play it. Um, and my relationship with it after seven and a half hours is 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 uh, where I am right now is largely just to sort of bury the lead is sort of largely meh. Um, uh, I I really struggle with this game and, and uh, I'm I, I haven't been getting into it and maybe it's just not the game for me. I intend to go back and play it. So I played I played the game for seven and a half hours. Was not particularly enjoying it. Um, got frustrated. Ended up buying Mad Max. Uh, and I've been playing Mad Max all week since then. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But interesting. Um, the, the particular issues, Brent, that I have with Metal Gear Solid that I think have made it difficult for me, and Rowan has been commenting a lot, uh, obviously, uh, on the site uh, in the activity feed about this because she is such a big, big fan of Metal Gear Solid uh, and loving Metal Gear Solid 5. And I, I think she hit the nail on the head with one of my key issues. But uh, we'll talk about that. Let me start at the beginning. So the, the first issue I had, Brent, um, and again, I want to preface this with the fact that I am not a historical, and I've said this on the show before, but I am not historically a Metal Gear player. I didn't really come to the I played a little bit of Metal Gear in the past, but I really came to the series in Metal Gear 4. I loved Metal Gear Solid 4, despite the fact that I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and there were 45-minute cutscenes, but I still loved the cutscenes. I loved the game. I loved the mechanics, the sense of humor. I loved the sort of epic nature of the game. I really, really was drawn into Metal Gear 4. I didn't finish it. I got very close to the end, and I just moved on. I had moved on to something else and got stuck at a giant boss and kind of went, okay, I'm done. But I played a good 30 hours of the game or something, 25 hours, 20 hours. I played a lot of the game, and I absolutely love Metal Gear 4. So Metal Gear 5, I was super interested in. I played Ground Zeroes. I don't think I finished Ground Zeroes, but I played Ground Zeroes, uh, and I uh, maybe I mistook Ground Zeroes to be... Um, more of a demo of the game uh, than I think it was an actual representation of the game. I don't think if I, I had understood that it was 100% representational of Phantom Pain in terms of structure. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I would not have gotten Phantom Pain, but the absence of story that existed in Ground Zeroes also exists in the Phantom Pain. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I just assumed that was because Ground Zeroes was meant to be a demo, so they just pulled out these missions and gave them to you in like this sort of like, these are the mission's choice structure, and left out the story because it was a demo, but in fact it is representative of the way that M- Metal Gear Solid Five is set up. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I understood that about the game, or at least the way it's been set up in, in my first seven hours of the game. So uh, here's your little bit of spoilers. The opening of the game is really what set me off uh, uh, in, in, with a bad taste in my mouth, and that is the opening of the game lasts about an hour, um, and it is almost all story. There is very little. Uh, it's almost like an hour long tutorial. Um, tons of cutscenes. Fine, Kojima. Totally expect it. Um, what I really got set off was there's there is a point in the game where your cr- the character is crawling, and you're crawling on your belly with the character for so long that I wanted to punch myself in the face. <laughs> um, and, and you and I have talked about like motion in a game, <laughs> Brent, bad, and pacing huh? and. And, you know, Rowan alluded to, like, she was super pleased that this was happening because you wake up from this coma and you shouldn't be able to just get out of bed and run down the hallway. And I yeah, philosophically totally 
A hundred percent. And it makes perfect sense. And I totally agree with it, but it made the game very boring for me. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, I was, it was, it was for an extended period of time was a crawling simulator. Um, and it, it, in the worst possible way. And it was so annoying and frustrating. It was just terrible. Um, and it made that whole opening uh, just took way too long for me. But And the weird thing is that's sort of very Kojima in a way and very Metal Gear in a way. And okay, so the crawling maybe in my mind was a very bad choice pacing-wise. But the rest of it's sort of Kojima. It took longer than it probably needed to and should and was sort of like big epic and blah, blah, blah. And then you get past the opening and all of that stops. And everything turns into this basically open world that you have these missions, you have like, let's, I'm just going to make this up, three main story missions and three what they call side ops missions. Yeah. Although apparently these side ops missions, they're not like side missions. They do have uh, implications to the story and they do gate things from moving forward. So they're not, they're, they call them side ops, but it, don't mistake that to mean side missions. They're just differently structured. Right. Um, so you have these missions and that's it. And, and you go from mission to mission and you like call the helicopter and get on the helicopter and go do this mission. In the course of that mission, you might have some cutscenes um, uh, when you complete the mission or that sort of thing. But basically, you acquire a story through picking up cassettes, reading logs, uh, doing that kind of stuff. Um, and so the game it completely, like the first hour, you're like, okay, this is a Metal Gear Solid game. It's kind of sweeping and long and narrative. And then all of a sudden, it's just not that anymore. Yeah. And it's literally just a collection of missions that you go do. Um, so... The pacing in the beginning really kind of set me off a little bit. Uh, I struggle with the, the and, and so, so so and that should be all of the spoilers for you, just so you know. Um, I struggle with some of the mechanics of the game, particularly the cover mechanic doesn't has not worked well for me. Um, all you do to, to to enter cover is walk directly at a wall, and it should put you into cover. There's no like cover button, um, and it doesn't work well to me. And for a tactical um, stealth game. Uh, I, I feel like that mechanic should be turnkey. That really bothered me. Um, the horse animation for D horse, which is the horse you ride, is is was like distractingly bad to me. The animation, and and again, Rowan was like said how much she loved how responsive the horse was, much more so than say Red Dead um, or Witcher. Mm -hmm. But the, the animation was so choppy and bad that it made me not want to get on the horse. Honestly. It made me want to run from place to place, and I know this sounds that might sound a little nitpicky, but it, it look, just looked terrible. You have this this world, this you know beautifully realized world, and this is Metal Gear Solid, and the horse looked like it was made by some other company, like the quality was just so poor. So that was kind of off putting to me. Um, the uh, and I said this on the site, Brent, and take this with a grain of salt. The hold, game hold is on. beautiful. I'll go get one. The the oh, game is beautiful. Metaphor, right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. The game is beautiful, but it's not like it's nothing special graphically, at least not on the PS4. I'm not paying, playing it on the PC, but on the PS4, it's nothing special. And I had actually said, you know, even Until Dawn was uh, as beautiful or more beautiful than this game was. And somebody was like, what are you doing comparing a game like Until Dawn to MGS? And I'm, I'm just speaking of like graphically speaking i've always to me metal gear has always been like the bar by which you measure other games and i don't know yeah. if it's because it's early on in the console cycle so everybody's kind of at this level at this point but it the graphics did not stand out to me at all in this game which is not a reason to like it or hate it i'm just i'm just pointing it out um so yeah man there's the the so far there's been almost nothing about the game that has grabbed me and it made me wonder i was kind of musing on this uh, Brandon, I was curious about your opinion and the opinions of our listeners. I feel like almost every outlet had somebody review the game that is a lover of the Metal Gear Solid franchise. Okay. Um, I, I don't believe I've read a review where somebody stated, like I did at the beginning of this, this just is to start my, off this with... This is my first Metal Gear game. Or, I've or, never played a Metal Gear game. Yeah. A and I wonder if that... If it would make sense on a game like this that is so... Um, I feel like it's so meaningful in this game in particular that you care about the franchise, that you care about the characters, that you have some knowledge. It would make sense to have two different people write reviews from differing perspectives um, and how much that plays into your enjoyment of the game. Yeah, you know, that's that's an interesting question. I, I, I was just thinking that, you know, like if I were to read a review, say, on Halo 5, as just as an example, and it was from a person who loved the Halo franchise and had played all the games... I probably wouldn't really get a lot out of it. 
just because it it's so far afield from my own experience, experience. Yeah. with that that franchise, and, and given the fact that uh, that Metal Gear Solid Five is the the fifth iteration in in the MGS series, you might be right. There, there, there among might, many others, there, yeah. there might be something to be derived from that. At the same time, though. I don't know. Given given the fact this franchise has been going on for so long and, and is so entrenched in you know in its own mythology and everything, uh, there, there's a part of me that feels like if if you're coming into this, if you're coming into this having never played a Metal Gear game before, it might be incumbent upon you to kind of prepare yourself for the experience a little bit. Although, having said that, I will acknowledge that it seems like MGS Five is is maybe a challenging game given what you were just talking about with the fact that the game itself doesn't really have a lot of narrative structure. Once you, once you get out of that first prologue scene, yep. that first hour or so and get into the game itself where you don't have that real heavy handed narrative thing. And honestly, that's the thing that's kind of attracting me to this game. Like I really like the, the, the absence of that. The narrative. absence of that actually sounds really, really appealing to me because I can have plenty of fun playing a game like Daisy that has zero of that. It all it is is an open world and, and and gameplay experiences to be had, and I actually really like the idea of a game that has sort of a narrative premise, which is you as as boss out for revenge on you know and trying to to rebuild what you had you know th- th- this private army that you you'd, you'd had and lost and you know putting the pieces back together and everything like that's your premise for the game and then everything else is just sort of in pursuit of that. The way that I play open world games, I am completely comfortable with that, and I actually really like the idea that it's such a it's such a 180 degree turn from what Metal Gear Solid Four was. That is really intriguing to me, and so the very you know it's one of those things that the very thing that is turning you off is the thing that I'm really attracted to, and I don't know that our experience you know the fact that I'm pretty well versed in the mgs series and you're not i don't know that that would make a difference i don't know well it, so there's and i agree with i understand that 100 percent. and i i do agree with what you said about like the halo review and because people you know they come in they come in very excited and they notice little things and and you know you know i people i don't think people understand the degree to which you might need to know the series but it, in the absence you know in terms yeah, of if, reviews i mean if, like, you, haven't played, I think if people, you haven't played peace walker chances are this game's going to be a little confusing yeah, and I even went and watched twice. I watched the 12-minute video that gave you the primer on like where this game is at. Yeah. But there's still, like, I don't care enough about the story. It, you hit the nail on the head, Brent. I don't care enough about the story to go look for it. Yeah. If it was given to me, you know, if it was told to me in some way, um, I, I did prepare myself. I did feel like it was incumbent upon me to go prepare myself. But I, I don't care enough to go necessarily look for it in cassette tapes, which is already a stupidly frustrating mechanic in most games, in my opinion. Uh, at least in this game, you can you can keep playing them as you walk around, so you don't have to stop in yeah, one place. Yeah. Um, but but the other piece of that is, I agree with you. I also like the idea of a premise and a world, and we're going to talk about that in a minute with Mad Max. Um, but at least for me, in the first seven hours of playing this, seven and a half hours, Brent, not like two, seven and a half hours. So I spent six and a half hours doing missions um, out in the wild, and the mechanics of the game just weren't aren't good enough to keep me interested honestly like they're not and they're the same they're almost the same mechanics as they were in metal gear solid 4 um mm-hmm. but they were like they just weren't enough in that time frame to keep me interested now that being said a couple of things number one the fulton is just fun as shit no matter what yeah um i like fultoning everything i can and i can't wait till i can fulton more things it's kind of fulton the game it is kind of, and i love that number two um, I did find myself, if and only it was interesting. Put this out in early access, and all you would have had is the open world and the Fulton, and and you and and you only paid twenty dollars for it. You'd have right. your game right they there. Did. It's called Ground Zeroes, by the way. <laughs> um, but they just didn't give a shit about your feedback. Yeah. Um, so the uh, yeah, listen, the other- listen, I got news for you. As far as Hideo Kojima and the Metal Gear games go, not giving a shit about your feedback. It's quite all right. Standard operating procedure. Because yeah. uh, they're doing no, just fine honestly, without it. Honestly, Brent, like I got bored playing Ground Zeroes, and but I again I didn't really understand, and, and I don't know if this is a fault of mine or, or a fault of theirs. Now I they can almost guarantee it. you it's your fault. 
I didn't understand that this is basically a one for one representation of the, like how the game was going to work at its core. Yeah. I really thought they only gave you the like just go pick these missions. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Because they were just trying to treat it as a demo, and they they re- that's they really, really what the game is. Like they consciously remove the story from Ground Zeroes because they don't want you to know any of that or whatever. And that's what I thought, and that's not what it was. Um, so the second piece I would say is that you know if you go watch the game trailers. Uh, or read the game trailers review of the game. It's very interesting. I've never seen uh, a company, a uh, gaming site, say this. They said something along the lines of, at first we didn't really like Metal Gear Solid, but then we took a moment and looked at it from a different perspective, yeah. and now we're giving it a 9.0 or whatever. Okay. But they start off by saying, we didn't really necessarily like it, and then we shifted our perspective. Um, and it makes me think, it made me think of, even though I was struggling to get into the game, I did find myself thinking about it after I played it. Um, and interested to go back and play it a little bit. But I think I will go back and play it. Um, maybe time away from it will give me some perspective uh, that that m- might make it just more interesting from a pure mechanical standpoint. And maybe some of this is coming from my uh, unrealized expectations. I was expecting just more Metal Gear Solid 4, but better. Yeah. Um, you know, from that sort of epic sweeping story and you know, that kind of stuff. And um maybe that was what plagued me. I mean, I think, I think that, like I said, I, I was surprised at the way it's set up, the absence of story. I don't care to look for the story. And absent of that, the mechanics are fine, but they're not that great to me. And a couple of the fundamental ones, like the horseback riding annoys the shit out of me, and the cover mechanic doesn't work, in my opinion. And now you've got a problem when the experience is based on was just a, a narrative thread, and it's all gameplay, if the gameplay, to me, doesn't feel that compelling. Well... As Tony Grice would point out at this point, were he on this show, your expectations going into something play a very, very large, they play a very important role in what your ultimate feeling about that is. Tony talks about this in relation to movies all the time. Most of the time, I agree with him. So, sometimes he takes it to a degree that, that I'm not prepared to go myself. But Tony's the kind of guy who will not go see a movie because he doesn't feel like his expectations are in a place where he can give himself the chance to enjoy it. It's like, you know, like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm just, I'm not, like, I'm not in the headspace where I, where I feel like I can give the movie a fair shake or something like that. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about. I, I, I think that, you know, your expectations for the game are, are not, you know, ultimately what you ended up getting. What you thought you were going to get and what you ultimately got were two different things. I, I always make the analogy... Like, you reach for a glass, you're not really looking, you think it's got Coke, and it's got milk in it instead. And, you, you you know, you could almost throw up violently, purge yourself. Not because you don't like milk, but because it's not what you were expecting. Right. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great analogy. So. I know! Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and you are a humble, humble man. Um, it is, it, it's true, and I, so maybe that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, may- maybe that's the issue. I'm not sure. We'll see. I'll go back to it again. I, I-, I really struggled in the first. I gave it a good, the good college try, seven and a half hours, yep. uh, and it wasn't obviously enough. So, in the in the absence of that, I went and bought Mad Max, and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about a game that you played this week. But then we'll talk about the experience with Mad Max as well. So, you, sir, have almost finished. 99 it hurts me it hurts me to see the number 99 percent complete. Yeah, I've uh, I've just about done everything Laura Croft Go has to offer. Uh, there's 14 achievements in the game. I've got 13 of them. Uh, the, the last achievement, it's one of these things where I think there's only going to be maybe one or two levels in the whole game where you can actually pull off this achievement. But uh, since I've been out of town, this is pretty much what I was doing. I was pretty much playing Laura Croft Go on my iPad. And uh, that was the gaming I got. And, you know, I talked about my reservations about the game last week and how I'm just not so sure about how they've adapted the sort of Hitman Go style into this game. But I'll tell you that the gameplay is really good. The gameplay is fantastic. The puzzles are great. They're creative. They're they're challenging. And there, there's some really, really fun stuff going on here. I, so had you just not gotten far enough in? No, no. I, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I enjoyed what I had played. It's just this... I don't know. It's it's just the It's just the whole sort of philosophy of the game. I just don't know that it makes sense. You know, and but it it's but it's separate from my ex, like my enjoyment of actually playing it, as opposed gotcha. to just sort of looking at it as a piece of as a piece of art or a piece of media, and saying, well, I really like the way this looks, but eh, it's kind of shitty art, or you know, like like it's that kind of 
Right. That kind of feeling. Um, anyway, but I, I, I've, I've just about done everything Lara Croft Go has. I will say that it's not a very long game. Uh, now I think they re- it seemed to me they released some expansions for Hitman Go. It seemed like there were a couple of like like a couple of updates that added some new stuff. I can't remember for sure, but I'm pretty sure Hitman Go is longer than Laura Croft. I I I, th- I think it would take you a little bit longer to get through. I could be wrong about that. Hitman Go took me about 62 hours to get through. So yeah, that's quite a bit, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't solve the damn puzzles. Uh, but L- Laura Croft, I mean, you could. I, I got through that in probably. I don't know, five hours, something like that. Yeah. It wasn't a yeah. lot of time. I, well, I mean, compared to a mobile game, you know, <laughs> I guess I'm thinking of, of, of uh, right for four ninety nine. Yeah, that's not a for five bucks. It's not. It's not a bad money spent. But anyway, so Laura Croft Go. I'm gonna try to polish off that last achievement, and then I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with it. But um, I, I'm definitely. I definitely got my money's worth. I guess is the bottom line. Something I hope I got my money's worth on is the aforementioned Metal Gear Solid Five because I bought that son of a bitch today, and it's oh. still in the case. I haven't I haven't had a chance to pull it out because I had to come and do this show with you. Still in the case. Oh, meaning I'm sorry for asking. I almost just said meaning for PS4, but yes, we discussed. that. Yes, uh, on PS4, you know, because yes. PC requirements, all that. But uh, yeah, so I got Metal Gear Solid Five, and I'm looking forward to playing that. Now I did get a chance to check out Mad Max. I got it from Redbox. Mm-hmm. Only got a chance to play for about an hour uh, because I just had a little bit of time that day. This is the day before we left on this trip, so I played Mad Max for about an hour. But uh, I, I did enjoy my time with it enough so that I went and bought it today. Yes. So I've now basically got to try to play both these games at some point. What platform did you buy Mad Max also on? PS4. Okay. Um, then I won't tell you that I picked it up on PC. They Green Man Gaming was selling it for thirty six bucks. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I remember I remember that that was happening. Yes, uh, and I don't know if they still are or not. Um, but um, I will tell you. Uh, I think you're going to be pleased, Brent. And I'm I'm excited to hear your thoughts on it once you get more time in it. Yeah. Well, I, I like it so far. I, I definitely had a good time with it. I'm not very far in. I mean, like the last thing that I did was went and got the body for the Magnum Opus. And then I went and you know, like I just wandered around and I did like one one random thing that I I, I came upon. So uh, I played about sixteen plus hours of Mad Max this week. Quite a bit, uh, and I am absolutely loving it. Um, it reminds me a lot. A lot of people have said this, and now I get it of Shadow of Mordor. Yeah. Um, the, the what remind what it, the part about the game that reminds me the most about Shadow of Mordor is is the fact that it is a solid game. That is just fun to play, um, and so it's it's not the most innovative game in the world. It's not uh, there's not stuff in it that we haven't necessarily seen before. It's got the fighting mechanics when you're out of the car of uh, Batman slash Shadow of Mordor, you know, mm-hmm. ish. Uh, it's not quite as good as Batman, no. but um, but they're good. They're solid. They're brutal the way Shadow of Mordor was, and I th- I personally find them quite fun. Um, the the uh, when you're in the car, the car feels appropriately ballsy and badass, and there's tons of upgrades you can make to them to the car. Um, I let my wife choose my car body, and I uh, she picked one that I would not have picked, and I now love it. The Die Rolla. I don't. I don't remember what it looks like. Yeah. I'm driving around with the Die Rolla. It's got the, the double headlights on the front, so it's got two on the left, two on the right, yeah. stacked one on top of the other. Um, the game is phenomenally beautiful, Brent. Um, I, I've taken tons of screenshots and is amazingly gorgeous. And they have a fantastic um, capture functionality built into the game where you can very quickly push down on both sticks and it stops the game wherever you are, removes all of the HUD elements and gives you tons of filters and stuff to take screenshots. And there, there's tons of screenshots on the website from me and from other people. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, and the game is, it's interesting, the game has review scores anywhere from a 4.5 to a 9.0. Um, and I think some people are nervous about picking it up because they're concerned that if they're not going to like it, it's not going to be good. Uh, and, and I can say it all depends on what your expectations are going in with this game uh-huh. and, and how you feel about it. Because How you feel about the, the way it's, it's um, set up is because it is, um, it, somebody who didn't like the game could, could rip it apart for being repetitive because it really is, you just drive around the world and go from, you know, one type of, inca- like you take over an oil refinery and then you take over a tank distillery and they're all essentially the same thing. You go in, you fight a bunch of fucking dudes, 
you you uh you know have to deal with a war crier and you you know you can look for hidden insignias and but ultimately they're all very similar and then you go do it somewhere else on the map yep. for me um the mechanics are well done enough just like shadow of mordor uh, and the world is so interesting and beautiful that i it's constantly uh i'm constantly enjoying myself and i actually i was i was talking to my wife i find it to be a very zen like experience my wife does puzzles like actual puzzles mm-hmm. with the you know we're, that are made out of cardboard yeah and so i know forth. what a puzzle is oh uh, yeah yeah you were being i'm re- not sure that everybody knows what they are i remember now um she does that and it's very relaxing to her and she just does it because she can turn off her mind and sort of uh she listens to her audiobook which she does other things and it's med- med- meditative for her and i found that this game is similar in that way in a very positive way yeah uh, that was very meditative. I played for a couple hours. I was very relaxed while I was doing it. Um, I really enjoyed the mechanics of it. Uh, and I've had a far better time with it than Metal Gear Solid, honestly. Um, I think they did a great job. I mean, it, it, the game is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, uh, Brent. There's certainly areas they could have improved. They did miss an opportunity with not having a nemesis system, and this game would be perfect for it. Yeah. Um, there's one uh, activity... In, in my 16 hours that they have designed where you have to go find minefields using... Uh, so Chum Bucket is a guy yeah, no who travels around with you in the back of the car. Um, Chum Bucket, I was concerned, would be very annoying because some of the footage I saw, he's talking and it felt like it was could get annoying, but they have him actually very well balanced where he only talks you know um, occasionally. It's not annoying at all. Um, he's got a dog and he's got a buggy. Uh, and there's, there's so there's this thing where you have to use the dog to find mines, but to do it you have to go back to the stronghold, drive out of the stronghold in his buggy, and you can't fast travel. Or you, whenever you just uh, PSA for anybody playing this game, if you haven't figured this out, when you fast travel, no matter what car you're in, you always arrive at the other place in your car. So there's a couple things in the game where like you might uh, find a guy carrying scrap and you want to take it back to the main stronghold. Um, you want to just fast travel back to the stronghold, you can't do it. you got to drive across the map to a stronghold. Same with Chum Bucket's buggy. So you have to go to the stronghold, get in his buggy, drive around the map in his buggy to go find the minefields, and then it's just this stupid thing where you like, as you drive inch closer and closer to the mines, the dog's bark changes. Then when he gets to a certain bark, he's spotted it. You get out of the car and press the A button to defuse it. And you do that three times in each minefield. It's, a, it's, it's astoundingly frustrating and annoying, and the fact that you have to do it in his car is annoying. Um, so there's things like that. The game is not perfect, but that's the only one I found right now that's annoying. Mm-hmm. I am loving, and I like Mad Max, but I'm not like crazy about Mad Max, um, but I like it, but I am loving being in the world. It is astonishingly beautiful, despite the sort of arid despite landscape. the hellish nature. It, it, but it's, it is. It's, it's quite beautiful. It's fantastic. And it's gorgeous. I love driving around. The car feels so good and yeah. and uh, personalizing the car. The car does so you feel do things- right. Like the car feels exactly like what it what you think it's going to. It does. And I and I absolutely love it. And I spent like tons of time and so I read an article about I th- can't remember if it was PC gamer talking about getting the most out of playing Mad Max and and I think I happened upon playing it perfectly accidentally. And that is you need a nice combination of story content and uh, side mission content. If you just do the story, your car is not going to be badass enough to do the things it needs to do. So you have to do some side content. But you want to keep doing the story as well uh, so you're moving forward to unlock some of the things you need to unlock. And so uh, I think it's important to do side missions. You can't just do the story to really enjoy uh, the game. So you got to go collect scrap and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so I could, I could see how one person might find it totally repetitive because on paper, it is repetitive, but uh, uh, but then again, so is Super Meat Boy. Super Meat Boy is very repetitive, yeah. but it's tremendously fun, and I find much and and so frankly, Shadow of Mordor could be you know considered fairly repetitive. Mm-hmm. You're essentially doing the same thing throughout the game, but the mechanics are so good, in my opinion, uh, that yeah, I, and the you, world you look is forward so, to the next opportunity to do those, those things. things again, and and the world is so compelling. It is so unlike any other world. It doesn't feel post-apocalyptic in a way that any other game world I've played ever has. Yeah. It's so uniquely Mad Max um, that, I, that I just am loving being in the world. And so I'm completely enjoying this game, Brent, 16 hours in. I've only finished, there's five areas, um, five strongholds. Jeet's stronghold is the first one, then Gut Gash, and I don't know what's after that. Um, but I have only finished... Um, Jeet Stronghold after 16 hours, just to give you an idea. Interesting. Um, and I did, uh, I 100% cleared it of threats, 
Um, but I did not collect a hundred percent of like the stash and that sort of stuff, yeah, that scrap, and, still which is interesting because when I started playing the game, it was I was really feeling completionist with every refinery I went into, every looting location, and after several hours, I finally had to give that up because I I just got sick of running around looking for that one piece of scrap that I missed. Yep. So anyway, well, totally enjoying it, Brent. I'm looking forward to getting back into it, which uh, which hopefully I'll, I'll get the opportunity to do maybe tonight or tomorrow. But for now, I think we ought to go ahead and uh, and try to wrap up because we have kept you guys here a while. So let's go ahead and go into the sunset. Yes, sir. I'm going to kick things off. There's a YouTube video that I think you absolutely must check out about nine minutes long. It is Shigeru Miyamoto discussing World 1-1 from Super Mario Brothers, maybe the most iconic video game level ever created, something that almost everybody, I imagine, has played. Very, very few people have probably not played at least World 1-1 of Super Mario Brothers, and this is basically a director's commentary, Miyamoto discussing how the level came together, what their philosophy was, how they were very subtly teaching the players the mechanics that they would need and the techniques that they would need to master during the rest of the game, and, and just all the little design decisions they made to guide you through that first level that was going to be the foundation for everything else that followed in, in, of course, what is one of the most iconic video games of all time. It's a fascinating, fascinating look uh, at this level, a behind-the-scenes look from, uh, from one of the people who, uh, who helped put that game together. So anyway, uh, that is my end of the sunset. That is an awesome end of the sunset, Brent, and I know you can see me smiling on camera, and that is because I just had this realization that you brought this wonderful sort of uh, in-depth video that really speaks to sort of the canon of video games uh, that I think is very thoughtful, and (laughs) I brought a video of Rocket League with real announcers. Yes, that's right, folks. Yeah. You didn't think you were going to get through an episode of Outlaw Gamer Radio without a reference to Rocket League. And no, no, you won't. Yep. So the reason I put this on here, actually, and someday I will stop talking about it, but the reason I put this on Promise. here is because I actually thought that this uh, video would give those of you who don't sort of get Rocket League or understand why we're, people are into it um, a, a, a real a sort of taste of why. And it's what they did was they took actual soccer announcers and laid them over some Rocket League video, some goals. And uh, I, I thought, number one, I thought it was awesome. But number two, I think it really gives you that sense of what it feels like to play Rocket League and uh, personifies, I think, why we need actual real soccer announcers calling these games. Yes, indeed. Or a very, very close approximation thereof. That's right. So check it out. It's really awesome, and it should give you uh, insight into why we all love this game so much. Who's going to ride along with us this week, Lauren? This week we have I, I Joker ACN seven. Right. Uh, I couldn't think of a. I, I know that there's a hidden name in there somewhere that I'm not picking up on, but I can't figure out what it is. Right. So Joker ACN seven writes. Joke I'd like you, rant. Joke Rackin. I don't know. I don't know. Joker Asen. Yeah. Um, Joker ACN seven writes. I'd like you to discuss the latest rant of gamers on YouTube against Jimmy Kimmel regarding YouTube gaming. What's your take on such statements? I mean, do gamers really need to stand up against a joke? Do you think it's kind of immature? I'm sure it's not a representation of gaming community, though. Below is a video regarding the rant, and he links he or she links to uh, two videos there. One uh, that's the actual video, uh, uh, both of which are Jimmy Kimmel videos. So, one of which um, is the original that kind of spawned all the hate, and then the second is sort of the the video reacting to the hate. And I think there's probably more. Yeah, at this point, Um, yes. So, you know, Brent, I think this is obviously out there, and I think it's, it's certainly a topical uh, issue to discuss, and I, and I think it's worth commenting on. Uh, it is an interesting scenario. I mean, I think at the end of the day, they're just feeding Jimmy Kimmel's monster, yep. um, which I'm sure Jimmy Kimmel is absolutely loving. Yep. And my initial reaction to this was, in fact, like, you know, this is, he's, he's making joke, folks. You just got to take it with a grain of salt again. Um, but I will say, as I thought about it more, I wonder... You know, so certainly there are many comics out there that make jokes based on stereotypes, mm-hmm. uh, and that's understandable. And people, it's it's part of uh, the culture of comedy, and it's I don't think necessarily an unhealthy thing. But I did I did sort of wonder this. You know, the stereotype of he made a lot of jokes about the stereotype of gamers being you know fat, single, geeky people that live in a basement and never come out, and you know yeah. that kind of thing. And that's basically what he was riffing on. Um, and I do have to wonder, 
you know, if Jimmy were would be so open and blasé about making jokes about other groups of people like that, if you would see him making jokes about stereotypes about gay people or about African Americans or about a- any other group of people uh, so casually uh, on late night that way. Um, I'd certainly hope so. I, I mean, I, I certainly hope that, you know, that he would go for whatever's funny and, and not really care about how it's going to play with people because I, I think that you can kind of, you can kill humor real easily if you know if you bring your uh, I don't know your 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 delicate sensibilities into the room to you. I mean, you know, comedy should be fucking challenging. It should be it, it, it should make you uncomfortable and it, and it should it should make you laugh nervously when you recognize yourself in it. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with laughing at yourself. Uh, I, I also don't. Um, I do think that uh, the death threats um, <laughs> are interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, half of me thinks that well, I don't know what network he's on. CBS, ABC, NBC. Half of me thinks that network is probably he's writing those themselves. Uh, but ABC, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, whatever. I think again, you're just feeding the monster. And yes, I know Jimmy Kimmel would be more than happy to make remarks about any group off camera, yeah. like like in a, in a live stand up show or whatever. Um, on camera is a little bit different. But yes, I I do think that we should. Uh, it, it, it's a joke. I mean, it's, you should expect him to make fun of people. Well, the, the thing for me is, like, I, I think that the main thing that this exposes is just the generation gap between Jimmy Kimmel and the people he's talking about. He clearly, I agree. he clearly does not understand, you know, what they're doing. And I, I mean, you know, this is the equivalent of you know comedians talking about you know kids wearing their hats backwards or you know kids with their you know their fucking hands their, their pants hanging down and everything. This is just this is a generational thing. Where he is, he he's he's past the threshold where he can identify with what people are doing as gamers these days, and so you know a lot of the jokes and things you know are kind of out of date stereotypes, uh, and you know the whole thing that he talks about about you know not getting like the Twitch culture and why people would want to watch. Well, and that's sort of where they started. Like, he really sort of exposes the fact that you know although he might play video games or you know or have played video games at some point in his life and everything. Where modern gamer culture is is not something that he he is a part of or he identifies that he understands. with, and that yeah. was the, that was like the real thing that that I kind of got out of it, it was just that it, it just you know just kind of felt out of touch to me to to where gaming is. Like it's obvious he doesn't really know all that much about gaming, but I don't know. Like I was reading stuff on websites and they were they were taking it so seriously. And it's like oh you know this seems so tone deaf, and you know Jimmy Kimmel's you know really uh, he, he he's really uh, promoting and all these uh, all these outdated negative stereotypes. I'm like, come on! It's not really worth it's not really worth getting upset over. It's not really worth worrying about. It's just a joke, and you know maybe it's a bad joke, but who fucking cares? It just I don't know. I mean, like it just the the fact that it has turned into a thing I find a little bit mystifying. Well, and to be fair, I mean, Although so it did start he's with- helped really turn it into a thing because he's gotten a lot of. Yeah, he, he, well, he he's wants got, to he's now. He's got a lot of material out of it at this point. A lot of material and a, a ton of views, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Um, but to be fair, I do. You know, this whole thing started, I think, with the Twitch thing and, and YouTube gaming. I think it's actually started with the the announcement of YouTube gaming. Right. And I, I honestly, I can a hundred percent understand why people who aren't gamers would be would think you want to watch other people play games. Yeah. I don't. I don't like that. To me, actually, makes sense that people don't understand that behavior. I totally get it. Like, I totally get it. If if you don't, if you don't sort of understand what's going on, if you just say the words, "I'm going to watch someone else play a video game," I get why you would you would do a double take at that. But again, but only if you weren't already sort of in game culture and got it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I think we're in agreement here, Brent, that the reaction is maybe disproportionate to the crime. Yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, all right. There you have it. All right. With that, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, as usual, we want to hear what you guys think about everything we talked about on the show, whether it's this Jimmy Kimmel thing, uh, Rocket League with real announcers, Miyamoto on World 1-1. What a great idea uh, to share that video. Thank you, Brent. What we talked about in the road, Mad Max, Lara Croft Go, Metal Gear Solid Five. What we talked about while we were hanging out in the clubhouse uh, early access and Steam's biggest selling games of 2015, and half of them are being uh, being from early access. And then what we talked about in the garage: the Star Wars Battlefront beta, Machinima settling their FTC charges, uh, the new PS4 system software update, the Deus Ex: Mankind Divided Augmented Edition, uh, Batman: Arkham Knight's patch, or the opening cinematic, Nathan Fillion filled Halo Five. We want to hear your thoughts on all of those topics and anything else related to gaming. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten, and remember. 
You don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing.